All right, so we're going to begin. We've been talking for a while about our series on last day events, um, and so we start today. I've solicited your prayers, and I'm very happy for them um, as we get into this. And since time is well spent, we'll just jump right in. Second Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1 was our scripture reading today. It says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Our message for this Sabbath is entitled, A World in Crisis, Last Day Events Part 1. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. We thank you, Lord, for your protection, your guidance, and your truth. Once again now, Lord, I ask that you just make me a nail on the wall, a a rusty, sorry nail, Lord. But upon that nail now, Lord, I ask that you hang a portrait of Jesus Christ. Let Eric Walsh not be seen or heard. Instead, Father, we're asking for a special word from you. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. We are living at a time when many are suffering from anxiety and distress over what's going on in the world. Even with all of the uh, technological advances, all of the globalization, with all that is going on in the world, it seems people are more concerned, more uncertain about what's going on than ever before. As Christians, we have somewhere to turn. And it's not CNN. It's not Fox News or MSNBC. As Christians, we have the Bible. And as you go into the word of God, there is a confidence that is produced that we should have in these end times that the world may not have. Romans chapter 8 and verse 22 tells us that um, this uncertainty isn't new. It is not a byproduct of the end times. The truth of the matter is that uh, upheaval and trial and difficulty are really the products of of sin. Romans 8, 22 says, for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And I loved our children's story. It talked about nature, but what we get is just a glimpse of what nature would have looked like had sin not entered the world. And so to this point, all of creation is groaning under the weight of man's disobedience. 1 John 5 and verse 19 says, and we know that we are of God and the whole world lies in wickedness. That's the condition of the world we are in. And there are those who think, why do I need a savior? Why do I need a redeemer? We have to be taken out of the current state of the world, a world so wicked that people will just walk into a building and shoot up people they don't even know, people they're not even mad at. That's the kind of world we live in. It is a world in crisis. In fact, Jesus speaking to this. In Luke chapter 21, and there, are, there are three chapters where Jesus, who is the greatest of the prophets, never forget. In Luke 21, Matthew 24, and Mark 13, he really gives a summation. He gives the overview, timeline of what is to happen at the end of the world. And we'll be using those three chapters as we plug in Daniel and Revelation and Old Testament prophets as we go through the series. So understanding those three chapters is important. Luke 21, 25 says, And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth. Look what it says. Distress of nations. With perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Men's hearts failing them for fear. And for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Before Jesus returns, one of the signs, we'll talk more about this in a minute, is that men will be afraid. It's not a coincidence that as a physician, as I, when I go to work, one of the primary reasons people seek medical attention in the United States of America is actually for anxiety and depression. 
I want to submit to you that while there is a clear neurochemical component to it, there's a lifestyle component to it, there are emotional components to it as to what people have gone through, uh, what modern science often forgets is that there's also a spiritual component to it. That we have basically created a world where people have nothing to rely on, nothing to believe in, except to tell them that they are the answers to all their problems. And so when life gets hard and they can't figure it out, men's hearts begin to fail them for fear. And literally, heart disease is the number one cause of death. So we are speaking to the time of the end. And when I was a kid and we we talk about this, sometimes it was a little spooky. Um and so you've got to be careful how you present this because it can get scary, but I hope when we're finished here you start to realize that you have nothing to fear. If you are in Christ Jesus, in fact, you can be encouraged. So to get really into this, I wanted, there are three, three um, uh, people that we'll look at. Daniel is one of them. Daniel, when he writes the chapter we're about to look at, is um, at the end of his life and has suffered great persecution for his beliefs. In fact, some of you remember, Daniel was thrown into a den of lions. I don't know about you, but that would have been a tough fall going into that lion's den. And I really love lions. Um, but I don't really want to spend the night with one of them. The other person we're going to talk about is John, who was, they tried to actually martyr John. They tried to kill John, but they couldn't kill him. And so all they could do with John is send him to the Isle of Patmos. They basically quarantined him off on a prisoner's island so that he would be no more damage to the Roman Empire. And the other gentleman we're going to talk about, who also gives these end-time prophecies today we're going to talk about, uh, is the Apostle Paul. And when you start to do it, and, 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 and when I study public health, one of the things we talk about is triangulation. When you start to look at these things from these different angles of, of, of three-dimensional, I'd almost argue a four-dimensional picture of what's about to happen begins to arise. And if you can understand that, there's so much power in it for us as Christians, meaning that one, we don't have to live in fear of what's happening around us, but two, we can be prepared for what's about to come. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which stands for the children of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep, and the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And I like verse 3. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. It's a, that third verse there is a foreshadowing to me of the, of the power that goes with those who go to proclaim the three angels' messages. But as you look at it, Michael stands up, and we're going to talk about who Michael is. A lot of folk don't know who Michael actually is. When he stands up, there's going to be a great time of trouble. We're going to have a whole, one whole message just on that, as there are phases of this time of trouble. It speaks about the resurrection, many that sleep in the dust of the earth, which is talking about then the second coming itself, and that they shall shine. Verse 4, but thou, O Daniel... Shut up the words and seal the book, even to the end of time. When is the book sealed until? The book of Daniel, in his own prophecy is stated, will not be fully understood until the end of time. One of the ways you'll know when the end of time has come is your ability to understand the prophecy, specifically the 2300-day prophecy, which we'll also talk further about as we go through the series. And I'm going to start to hang things on, the prophecy you can hang things on, so that as you move towards the end of time, you understand when it is. And we're going to go in deep, deep on that a little bit today. He says, shut up the words and seal the book even to the end of time. Many shall run to and fro. And one of the characteristics of the end time is that knowledge shall be increased. And I'm going to show you graphically and pictorially 
that prophecy has been more than fulfilled. And it will correlate exactly to the time the Bible tells you the end of the time begins. Very powerful. And one of the reasons I tell you all the time, one of the reasons we study prophecy, it isn't so that we, we, we kind of have some just simply so we have an understanding of what's going to happen. But in the studying of prophecy, you gain a confidence in the word of God that you will otherwise not have. I want you to understand that. When you study prophecy and see how the Bible predicted future events precisely, you can trust that if the Bible could predict the, the baptism, of, a baptism of Jesus accurately hundreds of years in advance, it, when it says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life, it gives you courage to believe in him and in his word. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two, the one on the side of the bank of the river and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And here he starts to ask, when is the end coming? Now watch this. Verse 7, and I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, uh, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that lives forever, that it shall be for, watch this, for a time, times, and a half. So when does the time of the end begin? At the, at the end of this very um, uh, kind of vague set of times, that tells us when the end of time is coming. If we under, you understand that, you should get a precise time when the end of time began. In other words, when the last days started. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the, po the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. During that time, something would happen that would scatter the power of the holy people. And I'm going to show you as we go through this series that during that time, times and a half is exactly what happened. The Christians in the world were scattered all over the world. Why? They were fleeing persecution. Whether it was the Huguenots in South Africa and in South Carolina, or the pilgrims that came to America, I can show you that just as the Bible is saying, it happened. Verse 8. And I heard, but I understood not. Then, then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? So Daniel says, after all that, Daniel's like, listen, I still don't get it. Please, Mr. Angel, explain this to me. What's going on? And he said, go thy way, Daniel. For the words are closed up and sealed. When are the words sealed up until? The time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand. But what? But the wise shall understand. The Bible defines a fool this way, and a fool is the opposite of a wise person. I hope that you all still believe that. Um, it says that the fool says in his heart that there is no God. The wise have an understanding, a belief, a trust, and a faith in God that helps them to understand. Many shall be purified and made white and tried. In other words, there is going to be a trial that happens. And when we do the lesson on the seven churches and we get to the church of Laodicea, I'm going to be able to show you that literally the, the lesson on the church of Laodicea is not a lesson in discouragement. It is a lesson in hope that in fact, the trials that we go through are exactly how we buy the gold being offered by Jesus uh, to the church of Laodicea. The difficulties you're going through, let me make this plain for somebody. The difficulties you're going through right now in your life, if you, if you allow the trial, the pain, uh, the dysfunction, the hurt in your life, if you allow it to be given to Christ, Jesus will take your pain and your difficulty and he will take it and it will be used to purify you, to melt away, to destroy and remove from off of your character all of the base metal of selfishness and pride and lust and greed. Trial will remove that so that when you come out the other side, you stand purified. That gold represents character. We'll talk more about that. 
So what do you take from Daniel chapter 12 here? Some of the points. One, there's going to be a time of trouble. We don't talk much about that today, but we'll touch on it. Knowledge increases. There's a definitive time prophecy as to when the time of the end is, when it begins. Speaks of Daniel's prophecy being unsealed. Uh, it talks about the trials that will purify, that the wicked will do wickedly. In other words, it's as if the w- wickedness is going to increase. We'll see that. And that the wise will understand. Right? All right. So let's look at this. Knowledge shall increase. Here is a graph. Uh, there are two graphs here. One of them shows you the countries. The orange actually shows the core countries where most of the technological advancement has not only happened, but has actually benefited from it. And so you can see those countries do better. But what it also shows you by default is that if you look back to 1700, the whole world had no, basically no technology. I want to submit something interesting to you, that the speed of a wheel turning on a vehicle carrying a person did not change significantly from the time of the pharaohs of ancient Egypt all the way up to the founding of the United States of America. A wheel turned this way. All you can do is hook up horses. You can hook up more horses if you want. But the more horses you hook up don't mean they're going to actually get a faster speed after a while. Right? And this is why even to this day when you buy a sports car, they tell you how much horsepower it has. So when you hear it has 300 horsepower, what it's saying is that it is the equivalent of if you were able to bottle up 300 horses and release them as energy in your engine. But I want it, what I want you to see from a, technolo- a technological growth standpoint is it wasn't until really the invention of the, of the steam engine and the tr- locomotion from a train that the wheels started turning any faster. And I want you to notice when that happened. You see that number there? 1780 to 1800 is when that begins. And it's called the Industrial Revolution, primarily and in a large part grown out of the United Kingdom. Let me show you some other stuff. Here it is. This one says, from the printing press to the global internet, technology has evolved and human society with it. And so you can see, look at this. When does the spike turn? Right around the late 1700s. It's very fascinating. Now, I put this one up here just for Elder Scott because I thought he'd like this. It has nothing to do with the prophecies, but I thought it was interesting. That supercomputer computational capacity over time, since 1998, look at the growth. In fact, he sends around some stuff, something called chat GTP or something, um, where it can write stuff for you, and it can write all kinds of stuff. I'm scared to use it. I'm scared it writes something I don't want it to write, and you send it, and then you get in trouble with the law or something. But this is the advance. I want you to get that. The Bible says knowledge will increase. Now, it's, it's a twofold prophecy because at the end of time, it's not just that the, um, it's not just that the, um, that the knowledge of technology would increase, but knowledge of the scripture would increase. Are you getting me? It's a twofold thing. And so at the end of time, knowledge would increase both ways. And it did at around the same time the process began. So when does it begin? Let's go through these. We'll show you. Um, it starts at the end of the time times and a half a time, as we said, right? So where is this mentioned? There, this same time period, we'll talk more about it later in another message, is mentioned seven times in the Bible. In Daniel 7.25 and 12.7, which we just read. Revelation 12.14. It's mentioned again as time, times, and a half a time, so you know it's the same time period. Revelation 11, 2 and 13, 5, it's spoken of as 42 months. Revelation 11, 3 and 12, 6, as 1,203 score or 60 days. The 1,260 years. And so uh, let's look at some of these verses. Because once you understand this, again, there is a precision to the word of God that cannot be coincidental. Daniel 7, 25 says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time of times and a dividing of time. Remember, we just read about it, that there's going to be this time when the holy ones are going to be scattered. It is speaking to a time of persecution, where truth is going to be suppressed. Daniel confirms that again in Daniel 7.25, when he speaks of the same time period. Revelation 12.6 says, And the woman fled into the wilderness... 
uh, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. In the Bible, as we'll talk about more in the series, a woman represents the church. And in this case, it's the true church. And the true church is forced to hide in the wilderness for the same period of time. This is that scattering that was talked about. Revelation 13, 5, and there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. So the one doing the persecuting and the scattering had a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And I won't get into that too deep today, except to show you that from a, uh, from a very pure biblical standpoint, this actually happened right on time. We talked about this during our apologetic series, but let me throw it at you again. In 538 AD, the Ostrogoths abandoned their siege of Rome, and this left the bishop of Rome to exercise the prerogatives of Justinian's decree, which happened five years earlier in 533 AD. The power and authority of the papacy grew. Now, Justinian's code says this. It is one of the great pieces of law written um, uh, if you study uh, uh, legal science. The code of our Lord, the most sacred emperor Justinian, concerning the most exalted trinity and the Catholic faith, and providing that no one shall dare to publicly oppose them. In 533, a law was written that would allow for the kind of power that is spoken of happening during this 1,260 years. Again, I'm, I'm going to go quickly through it today. We'll, we'll come back around to it later. And here's what the law says, just so that you can see the power of this law, change in, in the world in that it united the religious and the secular governmental powers into one. It says, we order all those who follow this law to assume the name of Catholic Christians and considering others as demented and insane, we order that they shall bear the infamy of heresy. And when the divine vengeance which they merit has been appeased, they shall afterwards be punished in accordance with our resentment, which ha we have acquired from the judgment of heaven. So the bishop of the city of Rome um, spoke this to, the, uh, his, uh, to most illustrious and merciful son Justinian. Among the conspicuous reasons for praising your wisdom and gentleness, most Christian of emperors, you have preserved a reverence for the sea of Rome. That is actually what you still to this day call the Vatican. And have subjected all things to its authority and have given it unity. In the year 538, power was given that would cause a change. And that was when five, and in, five years later, uh, when, the, when uh, uh, Vigilius ascended the papal chair under the military protection of Belisarius, uh, according to church history, that's when it begins. And so if you start to look at it, the beginning is 538 A.D., the ending is 1798, and we can show you that that works. And it's important to think of this as to how the legal system worked and when laws were enacted, because that's what triggers it. We're going to learn later on that many of the worst of the end time things that come will also be based on laws being passed. The papacy decreed power began in March of 538. Its decree death took place on February 15, 1798, exactly 1,260 prophetic years of allotted rule, which gave the papal power. How do we know this? Well, we have the day-year principle. So these 1,260 years, you shall have all, all wonder in the wilderness 40 years. After the number of days in which you search the land, 40 days, so a year for a day, each day for a year, lie upon your left side. This is what poor Ezekiel had to do. Lay on your left side 390 days. For I've laid upon you the years of Israel's iniquity. Complete these, lie upon your right side 40 days uh, to bear the iniquity of the house of Judah. I've laid upon you a day for each year. So when we look at it, we understand that it's the 1260 years, uh, is the 1260 days is 1260 years. And there's different names for it. It's called the wilderness, the great tribulation. It ends in 1798. So when does the time of the end begin? In 1798, in 1798, the French general Berthier proclaimed the political rule of the papacy of the, uh, at an end. He took the Pope prisoner to France where he died in exile. This was also called, we'll talk about later, a deadly wound was given to this institution. And that time was finished. And when that happened, um, the deadly wound was the end of the union of church and state and it established republics as a principal way world powers would be governed. 
So there was a drastic shift in the world at 1798 that continues to this day. And so the time of persecution ended. 1776 is when the United States was born. And during that period afterwards, it became a, this country became a safe haven for people escaping religious tyranny all over the world to this day. With all her faults, let me tell you, America is still a beacon of light because here we can gather like this and not worry that the government is going to run in here with guns loaded and drag us out. You couldn't do this in North, Carol uh, North Carolina, North Korea. You couldn't do this in, uh, up until recently, probably, you probably couldn't do this in Cuba and some other countries. Uh, even in China to this day, you, it, you do it, you have to have the government's permission. It is unique to this country. And one of the reasons that when we study the rise of God's remnant church, why America was chosen, because here the church would be able to thrive and grow. So it began in 1776 was the birth of the United States. I showed you that all of those powers, um, all of the tech began to take off around 1760. You started to see the, the rapid in, uh, increase in technology. All of that tells you that this is exactly the precise right time. 1798. So this is um, an environmentalist holding this sign. We don't have time. So Here's the thing, the world knows we don't have time. And I was going to put in a whole bunch of stuff about the environment, but I'll do it at another time. And there are those who are, you know, they made a movie The Day After Tomorrow. You remember that? And I was looking, on, I was looking online and I actually found, if you go back to 1970, there are documentaries made then that the whole world by the year 2000 would be in an ice age. And I could walk you through, they have been predicting the end of the world by uh, environmental catastrophe for decades now. It's interesting. And it changed. It changed from an ice age to global warming. Now they call it climate change. But it's interesting because the people of the world, many of them, are more concerned with the end of the world than we are. And watch this. And so is our enemy. Revelation 12, 12 says this. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he, has, he knows what? He knows he has but a what? A short time. Isn't it interesting? The devil who has lived millennia is concerned about how short time is. And we who don't necessarily get 100 years often are not concerned at all with the times in which we're living. The devil's upset. He's angry. And why did he become angry? Because when Jesus was on earth, Satan plotted before he was even born to try and destroy him. And that's also covered in Revelation chapter 12, that he would try and destroy the man child that the woman, the true church, would deliver. He tried to destroy Jesus when he was born. The government was after Jesus. A Herod sent soldiers to try and kill Jesus. Everything from the moment Jesus was, was con wholly conceived in marriage his womb the devil wanted to destroy him he worked his whole life not just to kill Jesus but if, if there was any way the devil could have gotten him to sin he would have won so the devil worked tirelessly tempting Jesus trying Jesus if you, I mean for some of you guys that are still in elementary middle school uh, even high school can you imagine the bullying and the teasing that Jesus got can you imagine what Jesus would have gone through growing up and yet when he went to go to the cross to pay the price for our sin, Jesus was sinless. He was spotless. And Satan was angry. And so he, he turned up with demonic force, the persecution, the beating, the whipping, the, the crown of thorns. He made sure to make Jesus suffer as much as possible. When Jesus died on the cross and, and exclaimed that it is finished, Satan had only one hope left. That was to try and keep Jesus in the tomb, and it didn't work. Let me tell you, something, being a Christian isn't a, isn't simply. You know, that's why I would never I would never use as my Christian a symbol symbol of of Christianity Jesus on a cross. The best symbol for Christianity is actually an empty tomb. When he got up and walked out of the tomb, Satan lost forever, and that's when he was cast out of heaven for good. 
He can no longer go to the gates of heaven and, and go up there and accuse us before God. And that's why it says, therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of, of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you having great wrath because he knows he has short time. And let me tell you something, church. The only way the devil can get revenge on Jesus and the only way he can cause pain to God is if he causes pain for us. He can only hurt God if we are lost. And so he is working tirelessly now to tempt us, to lure us, to deceive us, to walk us away from God. This is why when Jesus speaks of the end time, one of the things he says is, be not deceived. The Greek word for that deceived there, we're talking about that during prayer meeting the last couple of times, is planeo. It means to not be led away. Satan is going to work to lead you away. And so I, 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 I cringe. I sorrow. Folk I grew up in this truth with who are stalwart in this truth. How easily as adults they walk away. They're misled just as Jesus warned not to be. Matthew 24 and verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, telling us, when sh- tell, tell us, Jesus, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus gives the sign. So let's look at some things that happen after 1798. These things should become, if that's the beginning of the end of time, these things should become more prominent than ever in Earth's history. So let's see, does it fit? Does it fit that after 1798 things change? Well, verse 6 says, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So after 1798 and before the very end of the world, there would be a, an increase in wars. Did that happen? Yes. At least 108 million people were killed in wars in the 20th century. That's a staggering number and probably a gross understatement. Estimates for the total number killed in wars throughout all of human history range from 150 million to 1 billion. So there was an a uptick in the 20th century alone, and war still rages, doesn't it? Here's an interesting fact for all of those of us who are Americans. The United States has been at war 222 out of her 239 years. An interesting statistic, America has been at war 93% of the time it has existed as a country. Another way to put it, the United States has only been at peace for less than 20 years total since its birth. A time of war. The most powerful country in the world, one that we'll show you later on is directly described in Revelation chapter 13. And one of the hallmark sim- uh, signs of this great nation is that this nation is a nation of war. We to this day have bases all over the world. And that is a fulfillment of prophecy. And we are, we're at a crossroads. One of the reasons the world is in Christ right now is I'm watching the Chinese step up in, their, in the way that they're handling themselves. This conflict and threat with Russia um, Syria, we just bombed, I think, um, some spots in Syria that were supposed to be connected to Iran. This threat, the rumors of war keep mulling around. And that's what Jesus even clarifies further. He says, for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And it shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the what? It's just the beginning of sorrows. So between the time of 1798 and when the great time of trouble, or when the time of trouble comes, all of these things are going to happen. And I, I've, I've done it, I've presented all that kind of data before, but I, I'll show you just some updated stuff just to keep it interesting. This is um, earthquakes. So this is the United States Geological Survey, worldwide deadly and destructive earthquakes between six and eight um, magnitude. This is reconstructed. This is all the way through 2011. It's clearly an increase. And I have another slide. Even over the last 10 years, a lot of people asking, why are these deadly destructive earthquakes seem to be on the rise? If I was going to go into, into what's going on in nature, I would talk about the, the storms in California this year, the drought, the fires, the now the floods and the storms. All around the world, we see these things happen. Pakistan had a horrible flood last year. Australia had a severe fire just a few years ago where billions of animals died and, or, were dis, or were displaced. The world itself is as if it is in turmoil with itself. 
And here's the thing. So the environmentalists say that all of these hurricanes and tornadoes and uh, all these things are a sign of the environment going bad. Then how do you explain the increase in earthquakes? There's something else going on. The Bible says that God, God's spirit would not always strive with man. And what we are watching is God's spirit being removed from this earth. But it's not just the earth. It's man himself. Jesus says, nation shall rise against nation. And the, the Greek word for nation is ethnos, the word from which we get the word ethnicity. One of the signs of the end is that as we come towards the end, there will be heightened hatred and division along racial, ethnic, national lines. And what you're why, and we, I'm telling you, growing up in America, I, you know, after the civil rights movement, it seemed as if the country was heading in a nice direction, where it seemed as if, you know, there was tolerance and understanding between different groups of people. But I, it's as if over the last 10 years, maybe more, you're just watching people retreat into their corners and the country become more divided than ever. And I could show you that this is not just a, an American phenomenon, it's, it's a global phenomenon. So what we look at is that there's a current world crisis. We are in this Matthew 24, 7 stage. The time of trouble uh, is, is defined starting in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 9. For some people in the world, they're already in that stage in a sense. I'm reading a book about um, a young lady who escaped North Korea. Well, I finished the book. I'm about to read her other second book. I read her second book before her first book, so I got to go back and read the first book now. But she escaped North Korea, and she says she escaped North Korea just to try and get a bowl of rice. Well, we th you think we have problems here in America? Some of the stuff we complain about in the book, she talks about some that we pay. Uh, we complain about how much we get paid. And stuff. She, she says it's, just, it's like laughable to her. She says on her way to school, she would look for insects to roast to eat, so that when she sat in class, her stomach wouldn't growl so much in North Korea. And if parents were caught collecting insects to roast to feed their children, the government would be insulted and they could all be locked up or even killed for it. They took the words out of the North Korean language for things like famine and hunger. They don't, they're like, there's no such word for it. The situation is so bad. The government took the words out. And these are millions of people. She fled into China from North Korea and then was basically sold into slavery. And the, what happened to her and her mother, when you read the story, is heartbreaking. She's in America now. But what she can tell you is that there's no religious freedom, no religious liberty in North Korea. You worship the, the, the ruler or you die. He's the only God you have. In an atheistic society, he is still considered divine, given from heaven. But that merging of religion and government is going to visit the world one day. And we must be prepared for it. And Jesus describes in Matthew 24, 9, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Jesus says, And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. So there's persecution that's going to happen. There's going to be false prophets. And we'll show you that in more detail in a second. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Iniquity is sin. It's not just sin, though. It is, it is a disregard for God. It is knowing blatant, rampant sin. So has that happened? Absolutely. The number of mass shootings in the United States between 1982 and February 2023, you can see that even this graph trends up. There, I saw the graphs on gun violence. They just go up. The love of many has waxed cold, just as prophesied. And this is America, but I can tell you if you looked around the world, there are many other countries where you'd see some very serious crime statistics that are quite frightening. So we're in a crisis of now. There, there are a few components to it. One of them, the Bible makes it clear. One of them is calamities. And this is from the earthquake in Syria and Turkey that just happened recently. The death toll from the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria has surpassed 50,000 people. 
including 45,968 confirmed deaths in Turkey and 7,259 in Syria. And we must continue to pray for them. Our church is actually trying to send some relief aid there. But these are, these are signs. Just uh, over this week, Mississippi had the tornadoes and over 20 people, I believe I read, died just, I think, yesterday uh, in Mississippi from tornadoes that hit. These calamities, we're told, are going to happen one after the other. And the reason it's prophetically significant is that uh, if you went back 500 years, you couldn't know what was happening in, in Turkey on this side of the world. It's significant because you now know all that's happening. And because of the increase in the world's population, the death toll from these things is going to be higher. So it's prophetic. The third one, Jesus said there'd be false prophets, is a rise in spiritualism. This is from 1978 or 1979. Time magazine calls it the occult revival. One of the signs of the end is that there's going to be a rise in witchcraft, Wicca, paganism. And this, I, I, there's so much I could do. We could probably do a whole message just on this. But this is an article, Why Paganism and Witchcraft Are Making a Comeback. On a recent trip to Salem, Massachusetts, not far from here, I overheard the same question, is magic really real? For me, the woman says, the answer is yes. Now watch this. This is a sign that in parts of the world where they used to call on the name of Jesus. Now, it's not, I won't say that America was a Christian nation. America didn't always behave very Christian. But most people called themselves Christian and would shun occultism. That has changed. Here's what she says in the article. I am one of a million plus Americans who, whether proudly, secretly, or dabbling through the power of consumerism, practice some form of witchcraft. Witchcraft, which includes Wicca, paganism, folk magic, and other New Age traditions, is one of the fastest growing spiritual paths in America. Now watch this. Wicca be began to be practiced in America in the 1960s by feminists, environmentalists, and those seeking a non-structured spirituality, according to Berger. It was a largely underground movement, but commercial books about witchcraft published in the 1980s and 90s Productions, look at what she says. The witch says this. Like Charmed and the Craft created a surge of interest in youth with the ability to find communities online and with the decline in affiliation with traditional religions, witchcraft began its entry into the mainstream. Did you notice that she ties entertainment, consumerism to witchcraft? The church is receding Witchcraft is advancing. She goes on and she says, in petitioning, this is how she describes her worship. There's another paragraph, a, separate from that one, so I skip a little. In petitioning the Archangel Michael for protection, for example, I will recite a prayer but also make offering of wine, bay leaves, and cloves. In addition to venerating Catholic saints, I light candles to the goddess Diana at every full moon and place small bundles of rose marino, or rosemary on my altar to honor the dead. Watch this, church, because this is exactly what the book of Revelation says is going to happen. She says it herself. This blending of faiths has been a seamless process for me and other folk magic practitioners, despite what traditional religious authorities might say. When we study it, I'm going to show you. That there are three unclean spirits that come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the false prophet, a uh, prophet and out of the mouth of the beast, apostate Protestantism, Catholicism, and spiritualism. And the glue that binds them together is here. She tells you, the witch is telling you, it's spiritualism. The belief that when someone dies, they're not really dead, has opened the door for much of what is called the Christian world to believe that there is a, there are people beyond that they can communicate to. You can't communicate with those people. My family's from Jamaica, and Jamaicans like to sell, tell something they call duppy stories. And they, I mean, they, they tell you some stories, and man, sometimes they tell you them stories that I couldn't sleep. I'd have to go sleep with one of my cousins or something, I'd be so scared. But that's not possible. Dead spirits don't come back. Demons do. We'll talk more about that as we go through the series as well. But I want to show you what she's talking about. Entertainment and culture. Matthew 24, 25. 24, 24. Sorry, that five shouldn't be there. For there shall be arise false Christs and false prophets. 
and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive who? The very elect. The miracles that will be worked in the last days will be deceptive. But I believe in order to prepare you for it, entertainment will be used. So is it? Well, I've talked to you about the, the show Lucifer. That's the one on the left. Um, here's Black Panther. Everybody running to go see Black Panther. And here he is. He's Black Panther worshiping Bastet. Um, they call it Bast on, in the Marvel movies. Bastet is an actual Egypt, ancient Egyptian goddess that is worshipped by this superhero. And now all these kids are being exposed to it. We're watching a, one of the biggest drop-offs in Christianity is in black America. Did you know that? Black Americans, under the guise of, of, of social justice and, and sticking it to the man, they've been taught that Christianity is a white man's religion, which is complete foolishness if you just consider where Christianity comes from. And that the oldest Christian churches in the world are in Ethiopia. Right? And so yet this lie is being taught and believed, and, they're, and black people are leaving the church, and then they make productions like Black Panther, supposed to be a make-believe Wakanda, make-believe African country, and yet they don't recognize that probably one of the most Christian parts of the world is sub-Saharan Africa. Not a Christian in the whole movie. You think that's, all, you think that's by mistake? You can see um, that's in the middle of that's Doctor Strange and the Scarlet Witch. I don't even get into her, and there is a Dia de los Muertos of celebrations. Movies like Coco and these things have come up, and children are being taught by Disney from their little, little, little babies that they can communicate with ghosts and so forth. When I was a kid, it was Casper. Casper the Friendly Ghost. My mother wouldn't let us watch it, and I was okay with it, because if Casper showed up in my house, we'd have had some problems. But it's not just that. I was going to show some pictures, but they're so disturbing. I said, let me hold off till I can find good ones. This guy, I think his name is Sam Smith. Is that his name? At the, gosp- at the, at the, at the Grammys, did a whole, sa- what he called a satanic mass, where he dressed up like in his weird Satan outfit. This is not the first time. And there are people mocking Christians for pointing out that this is a satanic worship in the wide open. The entertainment is she isn't even hiding it anymore. And look at what got caught when. When he said, when he tweeted out that he's going to do this satanic, no, no, he didn't even say what he was doing. He just tweeted out, getting ready for the Grammys, blah, 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 blah. Look at what CBS tweeted out. Well, this doesn't show the tweet, but it's the caption about the tweet. CBS tweet about being ready to worship satanic Sam Smith raises eyebrows, compromised by evil. Did CBS just admit it worships Satan? They literally put out a tweet that said, he didn't say anything about worship. He didn't say anything about what he's going to do. And they said, we are ready to worship. Well, are they gonna, you think CBS is going to worship Jesus? I don't think so. Spiritualism. And as the spirit of God is withdrawn, and here's, why, here's where it gets deep prophetically. On the one hand, the devil's going to show himself in the red horns like you see him, ugly face, so that the whole world thinks of Satan that way. They worship him that way so that when, as we talk about later on in the series, when he comes as an angel of light and beauty and grandeur, everyone will say, that can't be Satan. He looks like the dude Sam Smith dressed up like. But it gets even deeper, the spiritualism thing. One third of Americans now believe in aliens. That's deep, right? Now, how much influence do you think Star Trek and Star Wars and E.T. and all the TV shows all of us grew up hearing about or watching, how much influence do you think that had on people believing that there are extraterrestrial beings visiting the planet? A lot. But again, it's not that Satan is going to just show it on TV because the scarier part of it is that the government is actually tracking these things. The Pentagon got hundreds of new reports of UFOs in 2022. A government report says they're supposed to release, relieve, reveal this, or release this report. I think they already have released some. So they're saying that, in fact, people are seeing alien or, or uh, unidentified ships that many believe are aliens. The government's like a part of it now. In fact, that's how they found the, the balloons spying for China. It was a search for UFOs. The government was looking for UFOs and found a Chinese balloon. That's deep. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 441 says this. Fearful sights of a supernatural character will soon be revealed in the heavens in token of the power of miracle-working demons. 
the spirit of devils will go forth to the kings of the earth and to the whole world. We've seen nothing yet. When I was a kid, the idea that the government would be even partly acting as if there were such things as aliens and, un- and UFOs would have been, you know, that was top secret. No one would have ever heard of it. Things are changing, church. Some of these things they can't explain. And there are a lot of people saying that maybe this is real. And I want you to understand that you live in a country where less and less people are believing in God and more and more people are believing in aliens. But the other one is a fall in morality and increasing secularism. Signs of the end. 2 Thessalonians 2.10, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God send them what? Strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, and but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Is this happening? Absolutely. We're actually watching Christianity on decline in almost all of the developed parts of the world, developing countries. U.S. smaller share of adults identify as Christians. The people who are religiously unaffiliated is going up. Paul says it like this as he's in the, in the prison waiting for his um, trial with Nero. He says, 2 Timothy 3, 1, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God. Did Paul just describe society today? But the kicker is the fifth one, which applies to the church having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. That there will be those in the church who have the form of godliness, but deny the power. What is that power? The Holy Spirit to transform character from such turn away. And why is this happening? I've shown you this before. If, there's, if we teach everyone that evolution is what happened and there's no God, if there's no God, what purpose is there in life? If we're just all the products of a cosmic um, accident, and if there's no God, there's no purpose, and if there's no purpose, pleasure becomes the highest of all callings. And that's why I showed you this before, this article, pleasure is the goal of life. Now, I was going to show you all this, I'll show it later, on the increase in sexually transmitted diseases year over year, it looks like it's just going straight. It looks like a mountain just going straight up. We're running out. I tell you this all the time. We're running out of antibiotics to even treat gonorrhea. The most common sexually transmitted disease we have no treatment for, like herpes. The world is changing, but the biggest one of the biggest signs of the end is that fear will control people. Luke 18 and verse 8 says, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth. Fear and a lack of faith is one of the things that will be on the earth. In Luke 21, 26, it says, men's hearts failing them for what? For fear. That's one of the things right before Jesus comes. But but we aren't supposed to live like the world. Paul, as he's in that, this is the same book as he's in that same cell, waiting for his trial with Nero, on the verge of death by martyrdom, 2 Timothy 1, 7. Paul says this, facing the end of his life in a cold dungeon, being hailed by a despotic lunatic named Nero. Paul says, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of a love and of a sound mind. And you know what people have lost? especially a lot of Adventists, they have lost having a sound mind. There's, they're folk afraid of everything. People tell me, listen, you better fly if you're going to fly because somebody told me March 1st, no more planes are going to fly. Where are you getting this from? Who told you the planes are going to stop flying? Daniel or John? Was it the Apostle Paul? Who told you that? Fear is what ru- runs everybody's life now. They're afraid of everything. They're scared of the virus. They're scared of the vaccine. They're scared of everything. Fear. The banks are going to close. This is going to shut. And people are panicked. They're running to the hills to live. There are folk moving so far out, they can't even get internet now. And they're trying to encourage you to run, follow them into the woods. Now, should we leave the cities? Yeah, but you got to be within striking distance to evangelize the city. 
Something's wrong with your last day Christianity if all you're concerned about is your own self-preservation. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but this is what I hear. Church people are chickened out. They're so worried. Oh, they're bugging this. They're bugging. What you going to do about it? My hope is is built on Christ Jesus. You think Daniel was in the lion's den looking around at the lions? Oh my goodness, there's so many lions in here. I've never seen so many lions in one place. It's dark and there's lions. You think the three Hebrew boys are standing in front of the flames? Oh my, that place looks hot. Well, this Nebuchadnezzar is rough. You think John on the boat to Patmos would say, man, I'm not going to have a bed to sleep on? This rocky island, I'm going to be by myself, probably never get another uh, uh, fruit to eat in my life. You think that's what they did? When facing death and trial, these men stood up stronger. And too many Christians, when this time comes, it's just a, matter, a bunch of panic. And, it, and it's, you, you've got people on the internet now, preachers, that all they do is preach scare tactics. But let me tell you something. Fear is a poor motivator. Doesn't lo- it, it never generates deep, true life change. I learned that when I was working, helping people stop smoking cigarettes. You could show them all the pictures of black lungs. You could show them all the pictures of lung cancer. You all that, and they might stop smoking for a few days. But they realize when they drag on that next cigarette, guess what? They're not going to have lung cancer right away. It doesn't work. But when, you, when I tied their quitting smoking cigarettes to their grandchildren and wanting to be alive to see their grandchild get married or graduate high school, you know what? All of a sudden, cigarette smoking didn't seem so pleasant when the, when the motivation wasn't fear, it was love. Why? Because perfect love casts out all fear. If you're in Christ Jesus, these last, you shouldn't be running around scared of everything. They, people scared. People are like, oh, you shouldn't buy that kind of car. You see the symbol on that car? That's a. I mean, you think any born again, true born again Christians have a car company? What am I supposed to drive? Even if I bought a bicycle, I could probably find a symbol on it. And I, I shouldn't ride the bicycle. He says, a sound mind. Why? Do not be afraid. You see, fear cancels faith. And here's one of the main reasons you do not want your end time experience to be one where you just live in constant fear because character cannot be developed in fear. You don't develop character in fear. When you have all that uh, adrenaline and all these fear hormones running around in your body, it does not allow for the frontal lobe to be developed. The opposite happens. When you're living in a constant state of fight or flight, it atrophies and destroys the frontal lobe. Focus moves to avoiding the threat rather than developing character. And the paralysis of fear makes one an impotent worker. You can't even do God's work if you're scared all the time. Acts of the Apostles, page 507. Look at what, what Ellen White says. What the church needs in these days of peril is an army of workers who, like Paul, have educated themselves for usefulness, who have a deep experience in the things of God, who are, and who are filled with earnestness and zeal. No fear. Sanctified, self-sacrificing men are needed. Men who will not shun trial and responsibility. Men who are brave and true. Men in whose hearts Christ formed the hope of glory and with, and who with lips touched with holy fire will preach the word. For want of such workers, the cause of God languishes. And fatal errors like deadly poison taint the morals and blight the hopes of a large part of the human race. As the faithful toil-worn standard bearers are offering up their lives for the truth's sake, who will come forward to take their place? Who are, will our young men accept the holy trust at the hands of their fathers? Are they preparing to fill the vacancies made by the death of the faithful? Will the apostles' charge be heeded, the call of duty be heard amidst the incitements to selfishness and ambition that allure the youth? God isn't calling you to fear. He's calling you to service. That means sometimes you're going to walk into danger. Paul was bit by a snake. He just shook it into the fire. Everybody was sitting around waiting for him to die. You see, when you're in Christ Jesus, he will sustain you. All the government plotting, all the wiles of the devil, they can't 
touch you. I'm not saying go and be reckless, but I am saying don't live your life so afraid that you become useless. Matthew 24, 27, but straightway, Jesus spake unto them saying, be of good cheer. It is I, be not afraid. When the disciples were on the boat and a storm was rocking them, nice Janae and Jackie to come up, and they were, and the boat was rocking and they thought that their lives were lost. Jesus had left them and gone up into the mountain to pray and allowed them to go out on the water. And the spirit of prophecy says, while they were there uh, 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 complaining and murmuring about Jesus not accepting to be crowned king by force, God allowed a storm to come to them. Let me tell you, there's a lot of Adventists now that talk so bad about the church. They talk so bad about its leadership. They beat up, our, they even talk bad about our preachers, some of our most effective preachers, folk like Doug Batchelor. They talk bad about them. You're doing Satan's work when you do that. Because when people watch Doug Batchelor or Stephen Bohr or, or some of the other preachers that, that, that preach, and you have de um, demonized them, because you don't like them on a particular issue. And this person who knows nothing of our truth listens to them. They're not, and if they hear you, they're gonna, you're going to negate their testimony. And whose work is that? Satan's work. When Jesus was walking to them on the water, heading toward the ship, they were panicked and afraid. When they saw him, they thought they saw a spirit and they screamed. Jesus' words to them, as we see all of the turbulence in this world, as we see all of the things going on, as the world is in a storm itself, Jesus' words to them are his words to us. <laughs> Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. What we're seeing happening in the world, all that's happening in the world are simply the signs that say, Jesus is on his way, which means that as I look at last day events, I don't get afraid. I don't get panicked. I get hopeful because guess what? I want to go home. I want to spend eternity with Jesus. I'm tired of this earth. I'm tired of paying bills. I want to live in a mansion with fruit trees that I can pick and not have to pay a rent check or a mortgage check to. I want to go and live with my Jesus. So guess what, church? Be of good cheer. The world might be in crisis, but the people of God ought not be. Jesus says, it's I. Be not afraid. Before I say the benediction, if your hope is that instead of turning away from Christ, that you would turn your eyes to him, but you would be able to stand in these last and terrible days, not in fear, but in faith. The confidence of the promises of the words of the word of God, where he says uh, he would never leave you nor forsake you. He says he would be with you till the end of the world. David says, I was young and now I am old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. You want to stand in confidence in Christ Jesus. I just want you to stand with me. As we close this out in prayer before we have our closing hymn. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word. Lord, it's overwhelming at times when we look at what is happening in the world and what is prophesied to happen. But Lord, we claim the promise that is 2 Timothy 1.7, that you have not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love, and of a sound mind. Lord, I ask a special blessing on all of us here and all that will listen to this, that, Father God, we would learn to stand in you, to walk with you, and for, Lord, for us to always live for you. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Let the church say amen and amen. You may be seated.